The UDL in 15 minutes logo, a circle around the words UDL in blue, in in yellow, and 15 min in red, followed by Gail Hines, a white woman with shoulder length, straight blonde hair, wearing a red orange top and black beaded necklace. Hello and welcome to UDL in 15 minutes where educators discuss their experiences with UDL. I'm Louie Lord Nelson, UDL author and leader. Today I'm talking with Gail Hines, who is the principal at Matoka Middle School in Richmond, Virginia. Today, Gail is going to share how she prepared her staff to learn about UDL. Hi Gail, how are you? Hi Louie, I'm awesome. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much. It's so nice to meet you. So let us know a bit about you. What's been your journey in education and with UDL? So I was a classroom teacher and department chair at a high school. And then I moved into a, what we call an instructional specialist for social studies for my division. And then after that, I decided I wanted to be an assistant principal and to be able to be an instructional leader in a building with students. And so I went back to a building as an assistant principal at a middle school this time. And during that time, I got a fellowship to Harvard. And when I was there at Harvard, I had my first sort of introduction to UDL because the gentleman from TAS came and he was one of the presenters. And then fast forward a few years and I became a principal at Matalka Middle School, which is actually the feeder pattern where I started teaching at the high school level, which is something I always wanted to do is go back to that same feeder pattern. I started working with one of our local state department, sort of like a liaison for what we call TTAC, technical assistance here in Virginia. And while working with her in the middle of the night or in the early morning, I had like, oh, I was really looking for an umbrella for which we were gonna do all of our work. And so I sent her a text at 4.30 in the morning and said, hey, do you know anything about UDL? And just so happened that she was the local representative <laughs> for UDL here in the Richmond area. So it was a perfect setup and little did we know that that's how it was gonna be. And so since then, we've been working a lot, introducing UDL to our school and framing our instruction underneath that umbrella. A screenshot of the Matoka Middle School website featuring seven boys from the cross country team. That's awesome. I was middle school all the way. That's that's the level that I taught all the way through and I love, I love middle school. I do. My description is, yeah. yeah, I always say, you know, they want to be so independent, but they're still dependent. And you find that little balance, right? And, um, oh, I just, it's the curiosity that's there. And I know their little, the attitudes are coming out and whatever, but I just, there is, it's a time of exploration that's like no other time in life. And I just, it's awesome. Yeah, what I tell my staff all the time is this is the time when they make the decision about how they feel about learning. So if we can grab them now and make them love learning, then they will be lifelong learners. Because when they're in elementary school, they want to learn everything. And they're in high school, if they haven't made a connection to it, I think, I think you have to get them in middle school. So that's what we talk about all the time. That's awesome. I love that. I love that. I think it's perfect. So can you share a little bit about Matoka Middle School, just the demographics, what have you, to let people kind of know that context? Sure. So Matoka Middle School is in what I like to call Southern Chesterfield County, which is a suburb of Richmond, Virginia. It is a very big division. We have over 65,000 students. We have 68 schools and counting. And we are as south as you can get in that area. And we are rural. And that's by design. Our county board of supervisors keeps this area very green because all the other areas are developing very quickly and getting big, you know, developments with townhouses and homes and apartments. And so they, on purpose, keep it very rural. And so it's a it's a small community. It's we have about 900 students on the average. Sometimes a little bit closer to a thousand. Sometimes a little bit under 900. But it is what I like to call like a real family community because. Everybody that is in Matalka mostly has always been in Matalka. So when I interview people, I say, you know, this is where I always wanted to come back to. This is the place I love because what the kids that I see now as middle schoolers are the children of kids that I taught when I was a high school teacher there. 
So it's very much like a, I want to say a bedroom community, but it is also very um, traditional, like Southern rural. So it's basically a black and white community. We have about 45% black students. You know, we have a lot of free and reduced lunch, but then we have the other absolute opposite because we have a, some very wealthy neighborhoods that feed into us. So it's really nice mix of students for us. It is my passion. <laughs> we have two Title I schools that feed into us. So we do struggle with some of the things that come with that set of circumstances. This year, for the first time, we are um, federally identified. So we are currently in the process of using some um, school improvement grant funds that were given to us from the state through the federal government. And so we have a lot of the same struggles I feel like that everybody has coming back from COVID. And also we have you know special ed students that are struggling. We have some black students that are struggling. And so we, you know, we deal with all of those things as well. Yeah. And in the middle school structure, are you guys uh, grades six through eight? Yes, we are six through eight. We do a block schedule. So we do four classes every day. And most of the kids take English every day, math every day, and then science, social studies on the rotating every other day. And then they take electives, two electives every other day. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. We know that UDL can be challenging to get into, and there's a lot of information in there. And you identified a way to begin that process, and it's proven to be effective. So can you talk about that first? Two teachers dressed in a Western theme standing in front of a paper cutout barn, a rocking chair, a carriage wheel, and some stacked wooden boxes for an instructional unit. Yeah, so we sort of build our whole year around a June we call it our June week. Like I have teachers that go like, it's almost June. It's almost June. They get so excited. I can't pay them to come, but I feed them really well. I get people to donate food. And then we spend a week building our instructional model, but it's every year it's based on a big theme, right? So one year we did gradual release of responsibility. One year we did learning targets. Last year we did discourse. This year we're moving to like leveling up the discourse and including writing in that. And then we come together as a school and the first time that we did it, we introduced UDL like a whole, it was a three-day workshop. The first day was spent on building all the foundational UDL things that they needed to know. Everything that from the whole big picture of UDL down to just the, all the little things, we identified a corner that we call the cautious corner so that we could tell them that these are you know, sort of our own version, but we did use the UDL 2.0 to get started. But what happens is they do UDL the first day, but it's always, we give them the framework and then they can use it on in their own work. So they get the framework the first day, we finish up the second day, and then they are sitting with their peers the whole time. They go into their PLCs and then they start looking at their instructional sequence and building their units using the fundamental concepts of UDL. And so that's kind of how we built it. We also, I did start a small pilot with my sixth grade English language arts team. I'm a big pilot person. So, because if you can pilot it with a small group and other people see them having success, it's easier to get them to change their mindset, to be able to see this as a way to do their work. Yeah. And so what, like what you were just saying, they're gaining new skills, they're given time to think about their mindsets and even how those mindsets mm -hmm. shifted. So were there specific reflection questions or tools that the teachers use? Like were they using the four critical questions? Yeah, we always use the um, four critical questions for all of our work. We are very much a PLC school. And so actually this year, we're moving forward even more. When I say we're leveling up, we're also leveling up our PLCs. And so I don't know if you're familiar with the Amplify book, which is the new book about PLC. So mm -hmm. coaching collaborative teams and PLCs that work. We have a really strong peer coaching team in our school that we developed as part of all the UDL stuff so that they would be able to help the teachers as they move forward, but it would be coming from their peers and not from always from the admin. And so those are, a lot of them are my leadership team. And so they will be moving into, we're doing the Amplify Your Impact as a book study. And then that's what, how we're going to level up our PLCs and make sure that we're keeping that in the forefront because the PLC work that we do is great, but it can be even greater. Right. Exactly. So that's how we're supporting each other and making sure that we're using UDL to, you know, remove the barriers before we design instruction. Yeah. That's excellent. Knowing that I have 
listeners from literally around the world. So Rick Dufour, mm -hmm. the questions are, the, those four critical questions are, what do we want all students to know and be able to do? Yep. How will we know if they learn it? How will we respond when some students do not learn? And how will we extend the learning for students who are already proficient? So just wanted to make that clear for, for our friends who are not around here. <laughs> Yeah, and that's built into our PLC notes document, those questions, M more for how it works for each one of them, you know, each PLC, but those questions are built into into the reflection document that they use. Yeah, they're just, they're brilliant framing questions. So the next idea you had was to give your teachers space to learn about UDL. We kind of talked about that, but you didn't have the funding and you touched on that earlier you fed them but how else did you pull this off because i know there are administrators listening to this going how did she make this work students sitting in desks and on the floor the teacher is leaning over helping one student who is sitting on the floor well like i said we piloted it first and so the english teachers that had been a part of that pilot were able to talk to the success that they saw in their classrooms but also we started small right so the first year we did all of English and algebra. And really, English did great and algebra not so much. <laughs> and so that was kind of a working through that the whole year. And then the second year was when we came back, brought the entire staff in and all my admin team is responsible for one department or if it's electives and some other things, sometimes it's multiple departments together. But we all work together with Dr. Crosdale, who's the the UDL person that I worked with, who's also works for TTAC here in Virginia. And she helped us from the first year, we made that training just a little bit different, a little bit better. We did whole group together for the people that needed to have the basics. Then we did a little bit of catch up for everybody that had been there, but needed a little bit more. And then we split up into groups and each admin took their content areas to work with them individually to make sure that they were taking then the fundamental concepts and adding them to their work that they were doing. Nice. And you guys are working at the unit development level, yep. or are they also working at lesson development level? Students at lab tables and desks working collaboratively. So they do all, right? So we start, we have an instructional sequence, which they, you know, they designed it when we first started. So each group, and we still have, you know, people that have been with me the whole time. Of course, we have turnover, just like everybody else is COVID. We couldn't control a lot of that. But we have a new teacher week. So everybody gets UDL during the new teacher week if they're new now, instead of having like whole group. So they started with an instructional sequence. They took our state curriculum and they said, this is what our kids, kids need to know. This is what we think they struggle with. This is what they picked apart the regular state curriculum. And they designed their instructional sequence. This is how we think it should go. This is how it would flow best for our kids. This is what we know they know coming up. This we know they need to know for the next grade level. They created an instructional sequence. From that instructional sequence, then they created their units. We kind of told them like 10 or less units, that's how it should be. And so then they created their units and then they created their learning targets. And then when they PLC, they look at, say we have two meetings, one's called the PLC, and then they do what we call content area planning on the next day. So PLC, they look at some sort of similar, you know, formative data or summative, but it's a common assessment of some sort. And then the next day they plan their lessons using the data, but also, you know, their unit plans. So it's a whole sort of big circle. <laughs> Students manning a table while they are selling holiday cards. Yeah, it is. It's a lovely cycle. And I think one telling piece is tucked in there when you were describing it is that when the teachers are picking apart that state level instructional sequence and putting together the, the curriculum in that comment of we know that the students know this and so instead of saying the students should know this and putting the marker possibly way out it's instead reflecting on okay historically this is what students have walked in with this is what we're hearing from previous grade levels, or this is what we're seeing in our own data. And we're going to start with, we think this is where they're going to be. And this is where we need to start. And then we can reframe as we move along. And that's so powerful. And it's so different. Two teachers standing on either side of a student who's holding a bouquet of flowers. They just as they need it. And we always look, we have state tests here like everyone else. And so, you know, they had all their data before we left for the year. 
and they'll have all their data when we meet again coming in and then they will look at that data and see if anything shifted you know COVID had a, a huge impact on our students not only because of what happened but also because we're in a very rural area and so a lot of our kids don't even have internet and so we were given out hot spots and those were sketchy at best and so a lot of our kids were impacted exponentially wow. and so yeah. they have to keep looking at it to make sure that what they know or what they believe to be true from other times it may not be true right now and so they're constantly looking at data we also give we have growth assessments now we used to give the nwea but now we give a a state growth assessment in the fall and the winter and then we give our standards of learning tests at the end of the year and so we also have that data throughout the year plus all of their plc level data that they bring to the table so they are always adjusting sometimes right in the minute and sometimes you know they have luxury to plan ahead <laughs> but not always yeah well i really appreciate this gail thank you so much you are a clear model of instructional leadership and helping your staff grow in their instruction and understanding of universal design for learning, but it's clear you also create a culture of learning and that's just beautiful. So thank you for coming on to UDL in 15 minutes and describing all of that. Well, thank you for having me. We are all about growing our Matalka scholars. So that's, yes. our, that's our whole deal. <laughs> Wonderful. Screen captures of the UDLapproach.com followed by the UDL in 15 minutes logo. So for those listening to this podcast, you can find supplemental materials like an image montage with closed captioning, that montage with audio descriptions, a transcript, and an associated blog at my website, which is the UDLapproach.com forward slash podcasts. And finally, if you have a story to share about UDL implementation for UDL in 15 minutes, you can contact me through the UDLapproach.com. And thanks to everyone for your work in revolutionizing education through UDL and making it our goal to develop expert learners. <laughs>